we have the um, a final invitee of the uh, symposium, uh, Mr. David Ng. Uh, David is president. Uh, first, uh, he was uh, president of the International Society for the System Science in uh, 2011 till 2012. After 20, uh, 28 years of service at IBM, is now uh, visiting scholar at our university and a visiting fellow at the University of Hull in the UK and lecturers at the University of Toronto, uh, Oxford University and University College London. His interest in uh, bridging systems ideas with a systems practice via ICT. So please take it. So today we are talking about uh, network uh, digital revolution, and we're talking about service system science. And I'd like to introduce some uh, provocative ideas because if we're talking about science, science normally requires data from where we understand the theory. And we're in a new age here. Um, so the, the way that we're looking at the network digital revolution with the Internet of Things, relatively new, we don't have any history really to fall back on. And if we think about uh, service system science, which is actually one of the uh, ideas that's been founded here at uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology, uh, we don't have much history uh, of um, putting that together either. So I'm going to introduce some ideas, and I'm going to unpack the title for you. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the idea of unfolding. I'm going to get to a little more rigor in what we could think about in terms of values. And I'm going to suggest that we might consider thinking about things in terms of places, spaces, and cases. And this is partially because when we talk about service systems, we should be thinking experientially. So if we're going to do that, uh, I'm trying to encourage a new field I'm calling service system thinking, uh, which uh, is the art and science of, uh, of uh, working with service systems. And I'd like to lean a little bit on architectural theory. And so people who are fan of architecture might uh, enjoy some of this. So one of the books that I, I teach regularly, um, there are, uh, so how many people in here have heard of Stuart Brand and, um, uh, and How Buildings Learn? Right. OK, so everyone now has homework. Uh, you go to YouTube, you type in How Buildings Learn, and there is a series that was done on the BBC uh, and in the bookman. And essentially the idea that, came, that Stuart Brand had at the time was that he really wanted to study organizational learning because that was something new that did not have history. But when he started to think about it, there's nothing to study because it's a new field that you're not defining it. So how do you capture data when you have no theory? How do you develop the theory when you have no data? And so what he did instead was he went over into architecture. And uh, Stuart Brand is a system thinker uh, from a long time. And one of the things that he, uh, the phrase, how buildings learn, is a flip on the way that normally we think about buildings and people. Because normally you think about, uh, well, well, architects, I always think about the architects who forget that people live in the house. And, uh, and, but you can also flip the other way around which is, from a systems perspective, learning means adapting to the environment. And as opposed to making the building the environment and the people the system, we can flip it around so that the building is the system and the people are the environment. So therefore, how does a building change according to how people are living in it? Uh, in the uh, series, uh, which is quite interesting, one of the examples they talk about, uh, they, you, you go to San Francisco and you see a row of houses and they start all exactly the same, and then you come back in 20 years and the houses all look different because this one had a family living in it, this one was single, uh, this one had a handicapped person working on it, so the way the buildings adapted uh, were, were shown there. So the reason for studying uh, and using architecture, and I, the reason I find it helpful, is that people seem to understand when we talk about things in the physical world. <coughs> we talk about services. Service is a bit tough because what do you mean by services? Is it something that you can see? Is it something you can drop on your foot? 
And quite often, uh, we, when we actually get to talk about services, I don't have a slide here, uh, it's easy to talk about water. So how does water get to your home? That is a service. And how do you, uh, transportation is a service. So these things are a lot more physical and sometimes easier to grasp. And I find that architecture helps in that sense. I'm going to lean a little bit, and I'm going to go into uh, the work of Christopher Alexander. Christopher Alexander was a professor of architecture and founded the Center for uh, Environmental Structure at uh, University of California, Berkeley, and uh, was um, uh, originally uh, published, he first published around 1966, 67, 68. Uh, then he came up with a series of books in the 77 time frame around pattern language, uh, around um, uh, the timeless way of building, and these got adopted in software development for pattern language work there. But I'm going to have the question, I'm going to bend this a little bit, which is, um, if we were talking about service systems, the way that Christopher Alexander might approach this is, okay, you have two service systems to choose from. Do you prefer the service system on the left or the service system on the right? Um, you have, most of you are probably not familiar with Christopher Alexander, but his, uh, his claim and the way that he thought about architecture was that there are some uh, objective measures. And so this is a very nice lecture hall we have here. And I could go around and I could ask people, we could do the survey, and do you like this lecture hall? And most people would say, you know, it's pretty comfortable, the sound is good, you know, these sorts of things. Um, and that sort of thing is very human. So this doesn't mean that we don't individually think that you know, the speech should be farther apart or we prefer a lighter wood or these sorts of things, but there are some things that are good, uh, uncommonly seen, and then other things were not. And so in, um, we have this architect who, uh, after writing all these things about buildings, goes off and writes a book about Turkish carpets. And this is a really far out for people, um, and you have all these computer science people reading this. And, and, he, and the question he asked is, if you had to choose from one of these two carpets as a picture of your own self, now I'm not sure what that means, then which one of the carpets would you choose? And I, I'm not going to do the exercise here, but um, uh, I, uh, Richard Gabriel, who's one of the people in computer science that's been leading, uh, says that what he finds is that most of the people prefer the one on the left, which is exactly consistent. So uh, I don't know if that's what you thought when you looked at it, you'd prefer the one on the left. And he said that actually the people that are the exception to this are computer science people, where it's random. And so what that says is computer science people have no taste. Or they have a strange sense of taste. But if we think about this in terms of service systems, uh, one of the questions I think we need to ask is, do you prefer one service system over another service system? And the way I'm going to do this, um, I'm in the middle of writing my dissertation, so I'm going to do, do research methods here for people who aren't familiar with it, is uh, I'm going to ask, can we make uh, better service systems learning inductively from architect-and-built environments? And so what we're looking at is architecture. Now, for those of you who have not had research methods, uh, up here on the upper right, there are three ways to do um, three logics in which you can create an argument. Uh, the first is deduction. And deduction is like a detective novel. You start off and you read and someone gets killed, and then you go through and the detective looks around, and then you get to the last page of the book, you discover who <coughs> killed the person. That is a deductive approach. The inductive approach is like reading a newspaper. The idea with a good newspaper writer is that everything about the article is written in the first paragraph, and when you read a newspaper, you read it quickly, and then you decide you want to read the rest. But that means you have all the facts up front, not at the end. Um, the last one of abduction is science fiction movie. And so you have a world, uh, so those of you who like The Matrix, you see The Matrix, you enjoy The Matrix, and you think, well, is that real? And that's the part where you try to put it together. Um, or The Terminator. If you think The Terminator, that sort of world, we have Skynet, and that's going to happen, uh, could that be real? And, and that's the abductor approach. Most research that we normally do is deductive. So we create the theory, and then we get data, and we say that it proves or disproves the theory. But what we can do instead is do theory building, 
which is that we take data and we look at the patterns and we say, well, I think this is what the theory is. In, in the field of service system science, we don't have a lot of theory yet. We're working on it, and there's publications, but it's relatively early, so it's not like saying in physics that we've proven that gravity works over and over again. So what I'm gonna propose is that we start here at the bottom with the case, um, and there's uh, the campus, um, uh, uh, the Aishin campus that Christopher Alexander designed in 1985, and we're gonna think about it as a service system and uh, look at how he did it uh, using the pattern language and the system of centers. Secondly, the result that we're looking at is that we're going to engage with service systems that frame them as experiences in places, spaces, and cases. I'll explain that what, what that means, but the idea is that when you do things from an architectural point of view, that people can live in the space. They're used to, we're three-dimensional, we are real. So as much as um, Gary likes to live on the internet or works on the internet, sooner or later he has to be called for dinner and come down and uh, have a share time with his family. Uh, the, the, the rule or the theory that we would like to have is the service system can be enjoyed by a variety of parties with value unfolding over time. Um, so the, the idea there of enjoyment. Do people actually enjoy the service system? Um, and I think this is something that when we talk about software development, we often miss because software developers use pattern language. But then the question is, are they using it for the benefit of the person that's actually using the application or the computer system that's being constructed, or the service system that's being constructed, or are they using it because they like it um, for themselves? So the, the idea of enjoying is important. There's a variety of parties. Uh, you have to differentiate when you're talking about service systems because there are people with different interests. Uh, the ones that are usually most prominent are the funders who pay for things, and then you have the beneficiaries who actually benefit from it. When we make a differentiation between that, uh, my favorite example is in law enforcement. When someone gets arrested and goes to jail, that is not the customer. So uh, in the United States, I know there's some recent cases because what, what has happened in the United States is they, they become very customer oriented. So therefore, they think that when you go to jail in some states, when you get released from jail, you should pay for the rent of being in the cell. Now, I'm not sure what that means when that happens, because what happens if you decide you're not going to pay your rent? Are they going to put you back in jail? Uh, but this is kind of the differentiation distinctions that we have in service systems, and, and we should get cleaner about them. Uh, I'm going to now talk about, a little bit about values on the folding. Uh, one of the things about service systems, and this is a standard definition that came from uh, the Cambridge and IBM uh, report, uh, that a service system can be defined as a dynamic configuration of resources, people share technology, people. So there's a definition that exists. But one of the things that we've done in service systems is that we've been busy on explaining what they are. So this, this is a being sort of thing. How do you know when you have a service system, what is it? And I think that we need to shift a little bit into becoming. What does it mean? If we're going to have a better service system, then there probably is a service system that already exists, and we want to improve it. So what do you want the service to become? When we make this, that shift, we have this idea of unfolding. And this comes from Christopher Alexander in the world of architecture. An unfolding is a process that gets you from one stage or a moment of development to the next moment of development. And so here in the, um, uh, in the first diagram, we have an example of a flowering plant. A flower unfolds. It starts off as a bud, and then it gradually unfolds. If architecture is done properly, what happens, and this is rare, the question is, when you move into the house and you've settled in on day one, is the house better on day two than it was on day one? After you live in a house for 20 years, is it better for you after 20 years, or is it better when it started? Now, these are sort of considerations that unfold over time. And thinking about things, it, it has to do with the architect and how they designed the place. Was it that they thought it was going to be a palace, so on the first day, you get this building, you get the service, and then it's all downhill from there, and eventually you throw out the building, or you tear it down, or you have to take that service, you have to kill the service, and come up with a new service. No, we should actually think about how a service becomes better. 
How is it that we would evolve it over time? There's some definitions here. Um, the, these slides are available on, um, on, the, on my website on coevolving.com, and so you can go through and, and get some of the detail. But an unfolding is a dynamic configuration that acts to generate form. In a building, it makes sense to talk about form because uh, things become physical in three dimensions. When we talk about services, we have to think about what is the form of a service. We haven't used the word form in service very often, but maybe we should. Uh, particular, uh, now on a second one, on the folding arrives from a particular hole in which it is forming, it's shaped by the hole, act on the hole, cause the rebirth of the hole. Uh, this is a clue into systems thinking. System thinking is a perspective on parts and holes, and so we're talking about the whole here. We're not taking the flower apart to understand how it unfolds. We're trying to understand the whole thing. An unfolding is by its nature personal and requires human input and human feeling from people doing the work, a central part of contribution to the formation of the environment. So we have a subjectivity coming in, and when they say people doing the work in this case, if this is people who are actually living in the house. We're not, you could talk about construction workers when they're building the house, but if people are living in the house, then they are uh, benefiting by it. Um, if, the, if you're talking about a service system, we have the idea of co-production and co-creation, then the people there should also have a voice in what's being built. Now, value is, uh, is a difficult and long debated term. Um, this is a, uh, a recent publication by Irene Ng at the University of Warwick and uh, Laura Smith. It's integrating value and I'm going to talk about this um, very briefly. I encourage people that there's a working paper version of this. So the, if you can't get to the published version of the library, you go to more University of Warwick and you can search on this and get the paper. Um, essentially, there's two major ideas. And for those of you who have studied some economics, there is the idea of value in exchange and value in use. And so if you have a service or a product, there is a value in exchange, so how much is it worth, how much would you pay for it to get access, or if you're going to buy a car, how much is it you would pay to buy the car, how much is it after you have the car, how much it would sell, that's the exchange value. And then there is the value in use. If you're driving the car, how much do you enjoy it? Uh, that might or not, might or not be expressed in terms of dollars. Uh, generally, if you have uh, more enjoyment in use than you do in exchange, you keep it. If you're not enjoying it, then you uh, sell it or get rid of it. Um, but the thing that, that Irene has pointed out is that there, that value changes over time. And so we have um, what's called, she calls AC value, or access consciousness, and that is pre and post. So before you engage in the service, uh, there is a value, like an exchange value, so you don't have access to a service yet. So Let's say you have a, a mobile, you don't have a mobile phone service yet. So what is the value of it before you get the mobile phone, before you engage, uh, and then you don't like them and you, know, you stop the service, well what is the value after that? Does it have value? So the value changes before, like if you, um, if you are, uh, have a, a food service and you're very hungry, then the value of the food is generally pretty high. After you've had a lot of food, when you get towards the end, the value is low, so it changes over time. There's also the value in the middle, which is the uh, phenomenological consciousness of value, and that is the value in use. So while you're eating the food, while you're driving the car, while you're using the service, what is the value then? And it happens at the moment. So when someone comes and talks about value to you, you should think about what do you mean by value? Is it something that's static? Um, one of the things that economists tend to get you thinking about is supply and demand that there's only one place that supply equals demand. But when we talk in the system sciences, we tend to talk about multiple stable states. So it doesn't have to be one place only where you get that stable state. You could actually have multiple places. There could be multiple values, different times for different situations. Now, when I spoke to you before about experience, uh, that is one way of thinking about it. But if you are a service provider, Giving an experience is really something that's hard to measure. So what we can do instead as a surrogate is use things um, like scale. So how many, how big is the service? All right. uh, scope, how many customers can use the service? Uh, there's speed, as variation. How many different variations? So uh, if you go to a fast food restaurant, uh, you can uh, have a very limited menu. 
or if you go to the Chinese food restaurant like I do, and you don't see anything on the menu that you like, uh, I at least try it sometime. Go to the Chinese restaurant, you see they have all the ingredients, they obviously can make it, and then say, I, I want the meat from A, and I want the vegetable from B, and I want the uh, noodle or something from C. And they look at you and I say, then I say, I'll pay for it. They go, oh, okay, yeah, we can do that, right? That's not a big deal. Um, but the speed of variation is one of those things. Chinese restaurants can do permutations. There's also an acceleration, which is producing new products or new services. So the, the reason I like to focus on these aspects is that these are all emergent properties out of a service system that's put together. So when you're talking about a service, uh, talking about transportation service, you could apply to that. A water service, you could apply to that. It's a very general thing. It has nothing to do with the service itself. But these are all features of the system put together. So out of this combination, you get the, the recipient who receives a certain scale, scope, and speed. Um, and then from there, they have the enjoyment um, uh, or the experience of using that service. So as I said before, Christopher Alexander had written a, a number of books. Um, the, uh, the yellow cover is one that's distinctive. These first three books were uh, 75 to 79. Oregon Experiment was a, a, a planning document from the University of Oregon. How is it that you involve users, uh, the university community, to design a university campus? And that's what that book is about. Pattern language is about towns, buildings, and constructions. There are things they notice that are good in, in buildings. Uh, and the timeless way of building is about this uh, elusive quality. We're talking about beauty, uh, we're talking about things like that. And the timeless way of building, when he wrote the book in uh, 1979, he called it quality with a name. Uh, one thing about Alexander is he published all the way up until uh, this 2012 book, and in the interim, he actually figured out the quality of their name, and he gave it a name, which is wholeness, which is one of the things the system seems to understand fairly well, the idea of wholeness. Um, but the language changes over time. Um, what I've been recommending people interested in Christopher Alexander, start with the newest book, because he changed the language, so he was confused himself over 50 years. And he was working through the ideas, and he learned and then he wrote about it, and if you actually go through it, you can see the chain of ideas. But if you're going to start and read something, I actually recommend this, uh, this book called The Battle for Life and Beauty of the Earth, which I really think is a really gutsy title uh, for an architect, because he's got a great hanging out there. Um, but it is concrete. Um, and what I've done is uh, I've, I've gone through this a little bit. Uh, I last, uh, last year when I came, I came to visit. So this is the uh, website for the um, um, Aishin Higashino School, um, and originally the site was tea fields. So in 1985, uh, we're out here uh, near Aruma, um, the, uh, the, it was all tea fields. They bought this property. Uh, the, it was supposed to be a joint college and high school, and brand new from the ground up. And they hired Christopher Alexander, an architect in the United States, to design it. Uh, this is what it looks like on Google Maps. Uh, it's in a regular shaped property, and uh, there's a little uh, ponds that they have in the middle with a bridge over it, and they've got the buildings, and you can see what it looks like. They've got, it, uh, they've got a parking lot at the top. The entrance is kind of on uh, this corner down here. So I'm going to go through this very quickly um, for time, uh, but what I've done is, uh, is I figured out that Christopher Alexander did eight things. Uh, when he's designing this. And I'm going to go each, through a slide or more on each one of these. I'm going to go through it quickly. So firstly, interview on hopes and dreams. So we're going to design a new high school and college. And the question is, what do you want it to be? Traditionally, this is when uh, people go out and talk about requirements and user needs and wants and stuff like that. He's saying, no, let's do hopes and dreams. So um, here's an example of something. Uh, the main entrance is critical to the character of the whole campus. Permanence on the edge of the site must be done with great care. I see the main entrance of the gate where I can greet students and teachers in the morning. So it, they want a grand entrance to the place. This university has a gate at the front. And so that's important for maintaining the character. That's part of the dream. Now, are you going to specify what the gate's going to be? Well, you know, it's a little early to be doing that. You just want to figure out. But there probably should be a gate of some sort. So those sort of ideas that come out. Secondly, make a poetic vision of this first sketch of pattern language. So what he's done now is done interviews for a couple of weeks. 
And he's got this idea. Uh, there's a new campus, has an outer precinct with a sports field, garden, outer buildings. Uh, it's made up of seven major entities. Entrance, main yard, to the center, home base, street, college, cloister, and lawn, gym. Okay, and that, that's basic sort of thing. Okay, so that kind of gives you a scope for what this should, should be in the, uh, in the pattern language. And then what he did is try to draw it. You have the property, and this is the first thing that he did. These are things you don't want to do on a computer. You actually want to draw them by hand. And so he, you can see they've got a main library, he's got a research center, and he's got the general idea there, a the gymnasium. And um, so the, the idea was this is what the pattern language is going to be. Uh, he has some criteria about completeness of language seven principles, which I don't know if that's really good or bad, that's what he did. Uh, refine the language through discussion. So you check that list, and, and so we have discussions. Um, so as an example, um, the second one there, political, economics, and social studies feature. The homeroom is very important for the teacher. Uh, Want to be able to see the student's face clearly. So this is one of the things uh, many of you probably presented before. It's always nice when you're in a hall and you can actually see the people's faces when you're presenting because you know that people are actually there and they're getting it, they're listening. So um, these sorts of things are important. No classes, visual materials, calm, wood. And that, those sort of things you're trying to get because the original idea had, it was there. Number five, obtain approval of the pattern language. And so at this point, you've got a list of, of uh, patterns. Um, this one's got five, just for the general character of the campus. And I'll flash through this quickly because there's uh, 120 of them, I think. Um, but here is walking up to the front of the school. There's the main gate. Uh, and uh, they have little notes about why the design's done that way. But architects um, like to have the curve. Because when you have the curve, then it gives you a nice feeling that, that first you don't see things, and then you do see them. Uh, the inner precinct, after you walk through the gate, this is what you see. Um, the red building at the end is over the ponds, and that is the uh, cafeteria. Uh, to the right is the Great Hall. And just a year ago, you guys had a big snowfall, so there's no cleaning up in that. Um, you have the buildings, the inner, inner precinct. Uh, this was a great hall that was on the right, um, and uh, uh, it's interesting talking about why things are a certain way, and if you read the book, you get into all these discussions about size of windows, and all these sorts of things that happen in the pattern language. Uh, the streets of the inner precinct, so walking um, off the, the hall, you go the other way, you have um, some of the administration buildings on the uh, left here, on the right you have some of the classrooms, and so these are... Um, things put into practice. Uh, the outer precinct outside of the structure, you have some features in the inner precinct, you have some outdoor details, and then you have interior building characteristics. So this is the judo hall. This is actually my two sons. And so um, one of the things they writes about is that they didn't engage the judo teachers until late. And so this is actually um, undersized. And when you go in um, on the wall and over here, they have all these pads because the wall's too close. But that's all they could do at the time. They, it was too late. After a certain while, you commit, right? Uh, but you get a feel for um, the style that they're trying to put in the place. Okay, so we have the pattern language. And what we do is negotiate the pattern language to come within the space of money. So the first guess requested here was 84,000 meters. Uh, the, the budget that they could do was 67,000 meters, square meters, and finally they said, okay, what you could do is if you want a bigger public yard, then you can have a smaller Denoji Center. If you want a bigger home base street, then you have to have smaller. And so you bounce that around. And so in this case, you have the community involved with the architect and working through and trying to design the system. Number seven, here's where the system thinking comes in. Um, and uh, I find some people are still struggling with this. But essentially, um, the idea that we had, we have these rough sketches, and there were seven centers, seven big things in the uh, architecture of the whole campus. Um, and the question is, how is it you configure those when you have, so this is a system when you put this together, because it's the part of coming to all, how do you put that on the land? So they had a ridge that was on the back side. They had a, a, a natural place for a large building that had a swamp. So what they're trying to do is you have the buildings and you have the land, and you're trying to you have a choice. You can move the buildings or you can move the land. 
right? And so this is why system thinkers can actually think three-dimensionally, because you, 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 when you're actually doing architecture, you have to be able to do both. It's not fixed. So when you talk about a system, and, uh, and for those of you who want to set us a, 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 a lecture on systems thinking, there's someone, um, I've lectured on this on YouTube, is that what you try to look for is the system and its containing whole. So in this case, we have the system, which is the buildings. They are contained in the site, in the land. You can change the land, but you can also change the buildings. It may be easier to change the buildings. Uh, I was asking my friend about, uh, about this. Uh, interesting, I was presenting for experts. I was sitting with a bunch of architects, because my understanding was that uh, it was more expensive to uh, change the land than it was, and they said, no, 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 no. They're saying, you, you don't understand, the past 30 years, what's happened is architects have made a, 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 a really good practice now. What they do is they come to a site and they bulldoze everything. And then they build it up. And I ask, well, why is that not a good idea? And it turns out that there are things that are underneath, like the water table and the rocks and the bedrock and this sort of stuff. And when you level it, you destroy what nature spent decades and centuries putting in. And then you get a leaky basement and you get the ground shifting. So it's better if you actually leave the land, you try to work with land, and change the buildings as opposed to changing the site. That's what my architectural friends have been telling me. So we take that, and Alexander writes about this in the book, that he had a lot of problems doing this, and what he eventually did was back in, um, in uh, Berkeley, he built a little balsa model, and what it actually required, when you actually look at the diagrams, is it used to have the entrance coming in from the south side, and now the entrance came from the east side. When you first came to the building originally, it was designed that you would go into the college, you come into the front gate, and you go to the college, and you walk a little farther, and you go to the high school. But they discovered that actually, if you took it and you did the high school first, uh, it was much more effective. It laid out, and they put the college in the back. And as it turns out, in the end, when they actually went to get this certified as a college, it never happened. So they, there are still spaces on the land where the college building was supposed to go that have not been disrupted. Number eight, adjust the site plan on the site itself, not on models. Now, this is being done all without blueprints, without having to write things down. Uh, Alexander believes that the way you should do this, and you should get, actually be on the land and looking at the way things are constructed. For those of you who are in software development, this means don't write specifications, write code. When you want to know if the system is what the users want, you show them a mock-up and you say, you said you wanted this, and they go and they usually say, yes, that's exactly what I said, but it's not what I want, right? So the, 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 the key here, and this is a long fight, uh, what happened was that they have the tea fields and they were putting up flags because you have that curve and that arc when you're walking up in the front and you want to be able to have that. And sometimes you say, no, move it two inches that way and move this three inches that way. And you can see it when you're actually physically there, but if you try to do it on a blueprint to two dimensions, it's really hard to get. So, this is the hard part uh, because uh, people love to have blueprints. They love to have those artifacts. So we've been talking about pattern languages. I just want to uh, uh, encapsulate what's happening here is that Alexander's been talking about a generative pattern language. So when you started off and you described it in the beginning, all those hopes and dreams, and you get them correct, and yet, if you look for the property of wholeness, or you look for the property of beauty, it is not in the parts. The beauty and the living is in the whole. And it could be because the room is art property, it could be a number of different things. But what you have to look for is try to get that generative property. And it's difficult to do that. Now, I'm going to back off a little bit and closing off here, um, but I'm going to talk about philosophy. Now, the interesting part about this, um, and having uh, spent a lot of time studying this and talking with my friends in architecture, is there is this distinction that happened in the 1960s that um, Alexander picked up on and, and doesn't uh, talk about explicitly, but what is the difference between architecture and design? What is the difference between architecture and design? Because people got confused. Now, it turns out in the around 1966, there was a book called Problem Seeking. And this is about architectural programming. And the idea was that architecture is problem seeking, design is problem solving. Now, I have a friend that uh, is an architect professor, and I asked him, how do you teach, you know, so you've taught architectural programming. He says, yes, 
I said, how do you teach architectural programming to architecture students? He said, very badly. I said, why is that? And he says, because when he teaches, then we, we start off with, um, okay, so uh, we have the kitchen, right? And so that's usually for cooking, uh, which is pretty good. Um, and then you have like a bedroom, which has a bed in it, and people sleep in it, but they also do other things. That's good. And then you have a living room. What do you do in a living room? Do you live in a living room? And so essentially the problem we have in architectural programming is that the, uh, the needs, the wants, desires, when you get it down into the concrete, is a many-to-many -many mapping. So a living room is used for multiple things. Some people sleep in the living room. Some people watch television and probably eat it in the living room. And so there's a many-to-many -many mapping that happens. Um, and when, we, when you do that, you get into the issues about, um, about setting goals. So we have two columns here. Uh, one is teleological development, which is generally when people are building for a goal, or building an application for a specific purpose. You have what's called ateleological development, which is building what you could describe as a platform. So uh, one, of the, one of the trivia things that people have, don't appreciate is that uh, Ward Cunningham invented the wiki when pattern language was being done in the software development world. So the wiki, this is not Wikipedia, this is actually original wiki technology. The idea about hyperlinking and being able to write things so that end users don't have to write code, these sorts of things were things that happened during writing the pattern language. Uh, but the idea about a wiki, so what is a wiki for? A wiki is for whatever you want it to be. You could write a book in it, you could just use it to jot notes, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, uh, Ward Cunningham has now uh, created a federated wiki, it even does addition for you in the federated wiki. Um, and it does all these sorts of networking things. But the difference is that if you do teleology up front, if you decide what the purpose is, when you design the building, you cut off all of these other purposes that could happen. You cut off the unfolding. So what you want to do is architect for a platform or something that's open, and then people who live in it can shape what happens with the service, the technology, the product, whatever. Uh, but it's a different way of looking, and, and it requires a lot of different ways of thinking. So I've been talking to you. Let's go back to what this talk was about. Uh, the question was, can we make better service systems? We'd like to do this in a scientific approach. Um, architects um, that don't understand science, don't understand materials, are going to get you into trouble. Um, so we can learn from some of their practices. Um, the idea behind this, uh, behind this is, uh, <coughs> service system thinking, is a 10-year initiative. I'm just starting off at the beginning. I'm still trying to get some of the definitions correct, but um, it's not my hope that I build a pattern language. That's not what this is about. I think that we need to get into communities and get them into the idea about this is the way you should design service systems. You should actually talk to the community, you should involve them, but the idea of requirements is fundamentally wrong. You don't want people writing down and then they say, oh, the world has changed. They go, well, we already started building it. We're not going to change it. We want to have services that are living um, and that suit the user and will uh, benefit us in the longer term. Thank you. So, uh, any uh, questions? this concept of unfolding discussion. Um, so if I understand correctly, uh, if the services has been used or has been provided through multiple, multiple iteration of the uh, providers and the customers, it may be uh, getting better and better or evolving, evolving. unfolding, right? And, and so in this uh, school example or building example, that what has been evolved is embodied in the form of the buildings. Yes. Um, what's the equivalent in service systems? So, so for example, if you go to like Skiabashi Jiro in the sushi place, like okay. one of the Michelin star sushi place, that's what the uh, Obama san went uh, the other day. And everybody prays. And everybody wants to go there because we all know that 
the kind of sushi that you can get over there has been proven through this excellency of the provision of the services. And in that case, where that this excellency is, is embodied, is that in the individual, Jiwa-san? Or is it like in a service process? Is that some kind of like artifact? So I try to understand what's the... Okay, so, so, so you're actually getting at the heart of, uh, of the differences in philosophy. Uh, because when you talk about teleological uh, development uh, or, or teleology, you have the idea, there is the idea of an ideal. Uh, in, um, Russ Aikoff had written a book called On Purposeful Systems, which is the original one. Uh, and uh, he talked about uh, beauty, talked about um, uh, justice, talked about these sorts of ideals. And so for him, they were absolute. But when you get to services, you get into the question of, is it actually the same ideal for everyone? Or are you looking for different ideals? If you are looking for a service that is, uh, and, and that some of the distinction is actually between products and services, when you have a product, it's fixed. It's, it's, and it becomes one way. When you have a service, there seems to be a, an expectation that the, ser that the um, service system should bend for you. So um, if you have a mobile phone service, if they only offered one type of mobile phone service, you would go, that's not what we want. It could be the very, very best phone service, but it may not be. Um, if, if we get into um, philosophy, a, a good example today in, in software development that leads to services is uh, between the Android environment and uh, the iPhone environment. Uh, iPhone environment is really uh, more oriented toward a teleological approach where it says, Apple defines what beautiful is, and it defines the way you use the device, and they do that with experts. And they do it through a lot of studies, and, and that's one way of doing it. And it's not necessarily right or wrong, as opposed to the Android environment, where you can go off, and, um, and in China now, they're building all sorts of variations of Android. Uh, they're changing the interface, the, they're changing the libraries, these sorts of things. So it's not that it's one or the other, it's that you have a choice. Um, so in the, in the case of, um, of the school, uh, the first thing we did was when we were touring the school, we went in and in the book, Alexander writes about the lights. It was a, um, he, he custom made some hoops and then inserted light bulbs in them and put them up. And the first thing I walked in, I looked up and I said, wow, there's all these LED lights. They put in all this entirely new lighting on the ceiling. And they, and, uh, they said, oh, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, um, Alexander created with the technology at the time because there was a constraint about the way things could be and, and he built these uh, lights, but what, what happened? And they said, well, it's a great hall and students were complaining there wasn't enough light, so we decided to put in light. But when they had, uh, in, in 1985, when they built it, LED lighting was not yet possible. So they were able to do something because they had changed. And I think Alexander would say that was good. Uh, and there's a lot of architects that come in and say, oh, you ruined my creation. But people who live in it should be the people that actually say whether they like it or not. Yeah. Thank you, David, for your great presentation. Uh, I'm uh, AJ Kagiwara from uh, Berkeley. And uh, your know, room number three, a service system can be enjoyed by a variety of parties with values unfolding over time. Uh, so, so IBM spends lots of money on R&D. Uh, that's the nature of your business. But for uh, all the economy companies, uh, making even a small investment to create new services is a uh, appeal at all because that says maybe you invest $1 million this year, and maybe we make $200 million of 10 years. And then maybe the payback period is only two years, right? And the ROIC is like 1,000%. But people still say there's a risk of $1 million, right? So, but the definition number three is very interesting because why are we arguing about this $1 million investment and seeing it as, as a risk? if our cyber system we're trying to create is uh, some people on their payers over 10 years. So how does a company like IBM manage this? Or is there any advice for those uh, 
people very old accounting mindset, you know, in a way. So, so, so first, I retired from IBM in 2012, so I'll, Jim, Jim could speak on behalf of IBM, but uh, I'll, I'll give you some impressions. Uh, firstly, um, one of the things I learned uh, early in my career at IBM was this statistic that it is uh, seven times more expensive to get a new customer than to retain an old one. So if you are, uh, if you are going to have a successful service, you really want to retain the old customers and give them what they want. Um, I don't know if, if the practice that you see in mobile phone services is that there's often a lot of churn, and so people change their phone service very often, which is not good. That just costs them a lot, a lot of money. So um, I believe that you should be serving the customers and you should be serving them well. Um, the question of whether you want to expand the scope, uh, that may require a different service system, and that's why I got into the, into the uh, scale, scope, and speed because you can't be all things to all people. You have to decide that this is the design uh, and you're gonna work that way. Um, the other thing is that there's actually a transition that's happened and it's an interesting transition for people around IBM for a long time. Uh, I joined IBM originally in 1985 um, and I retired in 2012. We started off, one of the, I was working at headquarters school planning at the time, one of the things they had to adjust to was that uh, in 1985, IBM was basically a leasing company. So you didn't buy computers, you leased the computers, and IBM used to get a stream of revenue over time. Um, it was very much a service, and then it got into a uh, consent decree, all this sort of stuff, and they started selling computers. But what's happening now? Cloud. So it's like, wait a minute, this is feeling awfully familiar. <laughs> and so it, there's a transition that's happened where there was a phase where there was product, but um, I, I see that the company will just adapt. Um, the, the company is always focused on its customers. I think that's where uh, its strength will be. Okay, thank you very much. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we take the uh, coffee break. Uh, we have uh, uh, 20 minutes uh, uh, coffee break. <laughs>